Urba 2000 looks at examples of urban achievements from which Canadian cities might benefit. The Urba 2000 series grew out of the French language series Urbanos, which probed a wide range of urban problems as manifested in Montreal. The city presented here is only one example of urban planning, which attempts to respond to human environmental values and needs. It was chosen following eight months of worldwide research on urban development. This film is an English version of the original French Urba 2000 series. Wait, I may have to put my glasses on. I can't see. All right. Are you ready? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and hello up there in Canada. Yay, hey, hey, we're good allies, and let's always be good allies and friends. So, Canadians up there, let me sing you my newest song. I'm a songwriter from New York City, Joseph Erdley Jr. My newest song is, I want a policeman on my street. Are you ready? I want a policeman on my street. You want a policeman on your street. Let a policeman do his beat. Put a policeman on my street. I want a policeman on my street. So does my neighbor on his street. I want a policeman on his beat. We want a policeman on our street. We pay the taxes, you and me. Also my neighbor, one, two, three. We want protection for a fee. We pay the taxes, you and me. Respect the policeman, you and me. Also my neighbor, one, two, three. He does his duty for a fee. Respect the policeman, you and me. Each week in New York, new projects and new investments crop up. Most have but one objective, a maximum financial return. But in the heart of the Bronx, there is a new urban trend. It is a housing project aimed at meeting the needs of the majority instead of the greed of a minority. Faced with a sagging social and physical environment, the clergy got together and launched a plan of urban renovation. Beyond the importance of construction and financing, is their desire to restore the vital elements in their community, including green space, fresh air, decent apartments, services, recreational and social facilities. This film looks at the Operation Twin Parks project, an improved environment for those that live in the ghetto. The Bronx, Easter 1973, once 70% white, today 80% black and Puerto Rican. The mayor appointed a committee or commission on urban design out of Columbia University and uh, they chose the Tremont area as an area for study for scattered site housing. Uh, partly because of that, uh, the borough president, uh, Badillo, was also very much interested in housing. Now, the Ministers Association, including almost uh, all of the ministers from this area, uh, four or five uh, Roman Catholic priests, as well as six or eight Protestant ministers went to uh, Borough President Bedillo's office and decided at that time that we would all work together, uh, bringing all these streams together for new housing in the Tremont area. And as I said, we had the cooperation of Urban Design, uh, who gave us a little bit of a special entree into the city and city offices so from that time, while we were talking about it, 1964, 65, 66, uh, 
these things all came together and it wasn't until after we had met a number of times and already determined that we were going to do housing that we took the name of Twin Parks Association uh, because we are located between <coughs> two parks in this particular part of the Bronx. We had experienced in this community uh, some very rapid deterioration, particularly uh, in the late 1950s and in the early 60s. And um, one factor of many was there was a, um, that started the deterioration was when they built uh, Route 95 or the Cross Bronx Expressway that tore down a lot of housing in the community and uh, it started a kind of a uh, flight and a mobility that seemed to, we have never been able to arrest since that time. There were other factors. Uh, there were a lot of old people living in the community and um, they were slowly passing away and leaving apartments for younger families. So there was an increase in population as well as uh, a lower socioeconomic group was moving in. All this brought along with it a lot of social problems and uh, I feel that um, the leaders that were here at that time uh, felt very strongly, especially the church leaders, that the church ought to be involved in the improvement and, uh, of the community. So they got themselves together and um, tried to do something about it. Another interesting fact about it is that this community at one time was a very prosperous middle and even further back upper middle class. And uh, it seems like there were some thriving institutions at one time. So for the churches and other institutions to see them going down was something that uh, was a kind of a pain and they wanted to see the community be brought up. But the interesting fact I want to bring out is that I believe it was one of the first times in this community that the Protestants and the Catholics uh, really uh, worked together in one project. This were the first buildings occupied last summer, We're right on the border of the Italian community and uh, black and Spanish community. And there's been much social unrest over these sites. There are very few Italian families living in them. Uh, and the conflict between the kids has been exasperated. There's been shooting at the site, at houses. That's the bad part of it. We're very uh, proud of the fact that we were able not to dislocate very many people. All, about 95% of the people in, in this house come from this neighborhood to begin with. I was pastor of Tremont Methodist Church for 20 years. Uh, in that time, when I came here, all the congregation was white, 100%. We didn't have, have a black or Puerto Rican in the Sunday school. At the end of 20 years, uh, it was 80% black. And I think the significant thing is that in all that 20 years, uh, the congregation stayed about the same. It averaged in attendance from 150 to 200 uh, on Sunday. And as white people moved out, black people moved in, it didn't seem to make that much difference to our church. Uh, one stepped in where another stepped out. This may be exactly what happened in the housing situation, and the two probably went right together. It was a community. Uh, the church was made up pretty largely of elderly people when I came, and very largely of young people when I left. But that's because this same kind of situation that you have in the housing, you have in the church, and this makes it difficult for the schools. There is a large new school part of our project just uh, four blocks to the south of here, and still four blocks in the city is too far away because of the great number of children that are here in the new families. Back there is a kind of house that we wanted to tear down because it's wood frame, 
It may last two years, it may burn down tomorrow, but at least in this transition period, we want to do everything we can to make it a community of people who are living together, and they're doing it rather well. The most integrated and important project concerning urban renewal and housing has been generated by priests. It should have been generated by city planners and city architects. Are you taking the city's place? I, I think one of the reasons uh, initially was that, um, that the churches were the, perhaps the, the one stable institution in the community, and when the city was looking for some kind of uh, an institution relate to relate to about the only thing left was the uh, was the church or the churches I should say a couple statistics that kind of heighten what uh, John Smucker said was in terms of the change of population that in 1960 I think there were 13 Jewish temples and synagogues and in 67 when I first came into the community only one of them was left and the other statistic was that, that we discovered when we got into this that we were losing a thousand units a year of housing in our community through fire and abandonment. So that uh, uh, the rapid changeover and the rapid deterioration, uh, the city was, I think, pretty desperate to find some institution in the community that it could uh, relate to and, and to try to get something done. Mrs. Watson, do you live a better life now that you're here? Yes, I like it better here. It's better for the kids. See, they had a lot of things that they had um, accumulated. We had to just keep drawing out because there wasn't space to keep it, you know. Now they can keep more of their personal things. And um, they're happier about it. What sort of subsidies do the people here receive? How do they pay the rent? It isn't too expensive for the people here? The renting process for the rent up is quite complicated, but there's basically two federal programs under which these buildings are rent. The first is the 236 program, the second is the FHA and supplement program. Uh, basically in both programs, the family pays no more than 25 to 30 percent of their income, and uh, the different government programs pick up the difference between that and what it would cost to pay off the mortgage of the building, which is anywhere between these, these rooms here run about $100 a room to build. Uh, under a 236 program, uh, a family pays about $38 a room. Under the FHA program, uh, anywhere between $10 and $20 a room family pays. So that in, in this building, every apartment has a different rent to it depending on the size of the family, uh, their income, and the size of the apartment. You have something you call, I think, a tenant orientation course. What's that? Well, the tenant orientation course, we found out that many of the buildings that you uh, build in the uh, so-called poverty areas, and I say so-called because many of the people are not that poverty-stricken, but because of uh, discriminatory patterns of housing in New York and in other places, you find that uh, 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 especially amongst black and Puerto Ricans. Uh, they're all living together on all economic levels from the lowest to the highest. So when you have a building of this sort, people begin to move in, you get the same mixture. 
Now, within that mixture, you're going to have some people who have used to living in rundown buildings, uh, slum type buildings that really didn't care as to uh, how they treat the building. Uh, their mode of living might have been on a, a much uh, lackadaisical or lower level, if you want to call it that way. And uh, we found that for some people, we have to run an orientation course. So you can't just say some people, you say everybody has to attend the orientation course. Uh, basically, the orientation course is to, one, introduce them to the services that we will give them, such as management, security, uh, maintenance. Two, we go about explaining to them about the building, about the operation of the building, the elevators, and the compactor service, which is the garbage uh, uh, service. Uh, then we three. Then we go into the business of the individual apartment as to how they treat their apartments. Now, in some instances, we have to show people how to hang pictures on the wall uh, because of the type of drywall construction that we do have. Uh, other buildings, we have to show them uh, where they can put up a curtain rod and how it should be put up. And we find that if this is done ahead of time, before they get into the building, and we make this mandatory that they have to attend, we find that we have less problems, and in terms of uh, problems such as destruction to the property itself inside the apartment, we find that we have a, uh, a very minimal amount of problems. Yes. Okay. Can you check, Mr. Martini? Yes. Come on in. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll ask her. Thank you. Excuse me. I understand you have a long waiting list of people wanting to live in your building. How do you choose these people? How do you select them? As was mentioned before, there, most of the housing is built under some kind of federal program, rent supplement program of some sort. And the federal guidelines limit the family's income as to who can live in, in it, and it's predetermined. We have been very frustrated because the law is written for the country and not for New York City, and it doesn't, uh, there's an inequity between uh, what was a, trying to be accomplished morally by the law and what practically happens. Um, we set up tenant selection guidelines that uh, the Urban Development Corporation to, uh, are more or less following. We had hoped to have an uh, uh, integrated project for development. Um, if we look at the whole area, including the concourse and Belmont and what have you, there, there was and is uh, relatively equal uh, numbers of whites, Spanish, and blacks, uh, theoretically on paper. But our country is uh, so organized economically and racially that uh, not everybody has the same kind of income, and uh, blacks and Spanish in this country have uh, uh, crossed the board a lot lower incomes, uh, and uh, whites having uh, predominantly higher incomes, and uh, when you build a private development based on income, you're then already setting up a dynamic where you can um, have, uh, not, not have uh, integration accomplished the way uh, we had hoped. How long have you been living here? We've been living here approximately uh, seven months. Where did you live before? I lived Washington a few blocks Avenue. away, uh, Washington Avenue. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as nice as here, perhaps. It wasn't as nice as it is here, right? As a matter of it wasn't fact, as uh, spacious as, as it is here. Right. We had more space. It's better here. We have more space here than we had there. Uh, the uh, we have good heating system here, and uh, uh, plenty of hot water, and um, of course more room. Is that that's the most important thing. The, the main thing was that we it's more room. 
Yeah, right. And Closet it's space. It's not. It, it's not too expensive, right? We pay a little more than what we paid before, but uh, uh, it's within our means of income, oh, yes. and uh, we seem to be managing. We felt, I believe, that housing would be one key of getting a hold of the whole community. Perhaps we were naive at the beginning, but yet. I believe because we had this total interest in the total community that in the planning of the community we not only uh, tried to bring in a new housing but we we uh, asked for new schools uh, uh, there was a new police precinct built there's a, a new hospital plan there's all kinds of new facilities that uh, we were always talking about so whether we have achieved the goal, I think it's too early to say, because a community is a complex, dynamic, ongoing thing. And each of us, while we are in the community as leaders, uh, need to see the picture of the whole, that we're moving along with a, with a, a goal of trying to improve this community. And uh, we're just hoping with the new housing that uh, as people move in, as we have more to do in bringing them in and getting them services, and building relationships that we will be able to accomplish the goal. But I would like to say this, that one of the keys to the whole thing is, is building community or relationships. Housing is not, the physical thing of housing is, is not the primary thing at all. If we can't build relationships between people in those houses or with the community. I think you're right. You have to be naive or even utopian to achieve something in this society. But it takes money, too. Where do you find the money? Well, eventually we had to turn to the Urban Development Corporation to uh, really get this uh, thing started, uh, and through them to certain people who would uh, produce the equity funding of the projects. But uh, while they came three or four years after we had been working intensely on it, in fact, I think the architects had done practically all of their work, uh, and it was ready to go. Uh, the city still wasn't ready to put the money down on the line, except in a very limited extent. At that time, the Urban Development Corporation uh, came into the picture, and through them, uh, we secured the funds uh, that were needed to get the project going. I think the important thing to remember about financing is that the community first had an idea. They had a concern and they got themselves together and then they looked around for what laws, like the federal law of 238 uh, law and uh, state and city, uh, what kind of programs that they could utilize in order to accomplish their purpose. It wasn't the other way around that first they looked for the money and then for a place to invest it. It was rather from the idea of the community first having a concern and wanting to know. And if, and here comes the idea of a motivation, if, if a community cares enough and they want to really get something done, they'll find a way to do it. We had a long talk with the developers of this project. They say the important thing is not only to provide housing, but also to develop a community. What do you think about this? Have they succeeded in developing a community or have they only produced housing? I think right now they've succeeded in developing housing right now, not a community in the truest sense. Do you find that people act as community members or just as tenants? Oh, you mean community minded as far as the people are concerned? Yes. I think they are community minded, but uh, someone has to reach out from the community uh, to have the people more or less become involved in the community. Unfortunately, this has not happened here yet. Uh, the mere fact that you build a place like this, or put up a development anyway for the purpose of uh, erasing uh, uh, urban blight, it doesn't mean that it's going to change the community. In other words, what you've really done, if you change the, a rundown building or, uh, or a site that uh, never anything has been occupied on, and you put something on it, that doesn't change the community. And if something isn't done to the community on the outside to protect that what you've already put up, 
then you find your community problems creep right into your existing buildings. So what has to happen here is the community per se has to more or less see that these buildings are protected so that they themselves can get more buildings, newer buildings uh, uh, in the community. Some of the tenants here say that in order to become a community, they need more services, a swimming pool, a gymnasium, facilities for the kids. Do you think this will come soon? I don't know. You know it's, a, it's always a question of cost involved. Uh, a builder comes in, he puts up a building. Now, if he's going to put in a swimming pool and, uh, and other services which are not related towards the, uh, the building themselves, then he's going to have to relate this cost in the building, and the cost of rent, that is. Now, right now, you can't build a building in the city of New York for less than $100 a room. And this is just with normal services, no extras. So if you put on your extras, uh, you're going to have to reflect this in the rent. And for the people that you want to serve, that you really want to serve, or really want to help in new housing, they can't afford to pay that kind of a rent. I would say at this point, this is where the city and other governmental agencies should come in and see that these services are put in because the builder can't do it at the, with the cost of construction as it is now. Are you involved in a citizen's action group? I am definitely, yes. I am. I'm involved in the Tenants Association that uh, is located here in this development. And I'm also involved in a community organization called Twin Parks Association. And uh, I represent uh, this building at the association. And uh, which, uh, well, my capacity there is, is an executive board member. And there are approximately 26 other board members representing 26 other organizations. I have here before me a memo issued by the 46 precincts stating briefly that uh, they will, uh, no date specified, will put up a sign, two signs as a matter of fact, indicating one, no parking at any time on the north end and on the south end of Grove Street. In addition to that, they will also have a sign, do not enter. They know, as we know, that this area here is no longer Grove Street, a throughway for traffic. It is a private property play area. And as a result of that, uh, they are going to put up these signs. Strength and unity means that a handful of people were able to get this done. A handful of people. We have here approximately 50 people, maybe, if not less. If we get enough money, it would be to like buy maybe a ping pong table so that they can set up a center like and a pool table or whatever equipment, maybe buy a um, volleyball net to put out in the yard so that they could have different games and whatnot to play during the day. So anybody that's, that wants to be a chaperone, we should sign this paper. We'll be in contact with you before next Friday. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mr. Gosset is in here yet? Mrs. Richards, you're a member of Twin Parks Association. What are you doing? Well, my function is on the Tenant Selection Committee. By that, we, when the building first started, a group of us, or represent, represented organization, we would review the applicants and categorize them, like, you know, whether it's ethnic background or income or size of family. Do you think Twin Parks has succeeded in building a better community? And to an extent, we have succeeded and it's still trying. Because, like I said, the people that are housed in Twin Park, we come together to plan housing, to plan different things, recreation for kids. We're interested in, like, our community and bringing other development, maybe more stores to in our local districts. And we, we do help in sanitation or all the areas that people are concerned about, so there is a better community coming up. Can you see any signs of a better life here now? Mm. Yeah, there are. Yeah, there is. And we are more aware now to keep our neighborhood, you know, up to par, more cleanliness and like that from the old neighborhood. Okay, uh, who's, who's the chairman of your committee? 
Power. I'm talking about the kids. You are you are brave? So you're supposed to be up here, huh? <laughs> Go get that seat over there. Who's your co chair? Uh, get chair and get up there. Do you have a secretary? Charlie. <laughs> Come here. Okay, so what we're really doing this, we're just gonna sit in on you guys, so you go for yourself. Do you all have any more uh, committee members? Yes, Hazel, yes. Hazel, Hazel and Didi. 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 Hazel and Didi. They're right there. What? Two diagonal. Right like there. that. The one in both threads. Um, would you two like to come up here and quite sure these are those that give you their seats? What we want or what we want to do. I mean, you guys, uh, you tell us exactly how you feel about everything. You understand? Right. Well, if we, if we want to clean up this building, I don't see why we can't. Because if we go clean, clean up this building and people going to give complaints, I don't see why they want to give us give complaints because that we doing it for because they live here and we live here and we're going to have some place to live besides living with roaches and rats and all that stuff that's crawling around. Correct. Right. Can I say one thing, right? Even though you all know you had this gripe today with the management, right? Why didn't you all invite them to the thing tonight? Mr. Manat said you couldn't make it. Was it anybody else in the office? Nope. No. It was just Mr. Manat. And what about the adults? What are they going to do if they don't show up to the meeting? And they keep doing... See, uh, this is your in. meeting here. Yeah. Well, yes, yeah. Yeah, but we're trying to get the adults to come down here, too, to get something through their heads. I mean, you're not going to never get everybody to participate in anything. The only way you can get everybody to come somewhere is if you're giving away money, right? It's their building. Huh? It's their building. If they want to live in the slum, they can go nothing. back where they Some people don't care. I know they don't care, so how come they have to move okay, if they didn't care? Just because they don't care, should you have that same attitude? No. Nah. All right, then, well, if they don't care, just push them aside. Push you them understand? aside, right? Like a... Uh, Let's say we cleaned the floors yesterday, right? We came back upstairs to wax the floor. There was a whole lot of garbage on the sixth floor, and we just finished mopping it and sweeping it. I know this, this is discouraging, right? Yeah. Right, but you gotta, you gotta continue to do these things. You gotta make grown people look like they are, are dummies. In the summertime, Artie was, was um, keeping good decoration. He wore like little Monopoly game, trouble game, and everything. When it was raining, he brought everybody in here. He lined up the chairs. He put, he brought a record player, tape player. He brought like little things for when it was raining, and the decoration was for people to do with it. Hey, there was nothing to do. Okay, so what happened? Well, we didn't have any money. We had nothing to do. Right. Well, what happened? Well, we didn't have any money. We had nothing to do. So what happened? Well, we didn't have any money. We had nothing to do. So what happened? It's worth something. Because if you were never here, nobody would have never thought of that. Like we can have pay party, um, to get enough money to, you know, like buy a mix for cookies, like say a group of boys, you know, go around and sell them. And that's the way we can get money to help buy the pool tables with the grown ups. But <coughs> it's something I'd like to say, um, according to uh, He's saying, the point is that since we started these last few meetings, the last month or so, we've been trying to get the building together somehow. And the major problem is the kids, because we all trying to say the kids doing this, the kids doing that. To prevent something, we gotta find something else for the kids to do besides writing the walls. We just don't say that we're gonna go out right now, tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, and buy them a three or four pool table, $700, $800 each and so forth. We're trying to get together the whole joint, the whole three or four buildings, whatever, everybody, parents, kids, everyone, and try to do something. Whatever it is, we'll see.
Beyond Brooklyn and Bay Ridge, the situation is different. 99% white, $100,000 villas, people fiercely attached to their district, their street, their property, some of them for up to 40 or 50 years. This is the silent majority. Is it possible that in such a city, but in New York, there is no communication between such different sectors? A television station, Channel 13, is attempting to provide coverage of the entire city in order to air the questions of diverse groups and to permit a genuine urban forum. Today, a Channel 13 crew is covering the opposition of Bay Ridge residents to the construction of an old people's home, which in their eyes is a threat to property values in the area. Formerly at 22 stories, the building occupied 20% of available land. As you know, 80% was empty land for parking outside Recreation Garden. The 16-story building had to be spread out, and it occupies now 25% of the land. Now, that still leaves 75% open space, so it's not covering the whole site by any means. Because of cost factors, we could not reduce the number of apartments because the whole construction cost is... The rent is simply dividing the number of apartments into the total project cost. So we had to keep approximately the same number of apartments so that rents would remain the same. It was our understanding that following reaching a compromise in the height of the building, we would be able to move rather quickly through the Board of Estimate. Right now, we're not sure what's happening. We had to go back with 16 stories to the New York City Planning Commission. We passed at 22 stories. We had to return to the City Planning Commission again at 16 stories, since this was considered a major change in the building. They had to approve it again. The earliest date the City Planning Commission could calendar Shore Hill was May the 2nd. We, it was our understanding that it had to be calendared for the City Planning Commission at least 10 days before being heard. It has not been calendared at this time as we had been told it would, uh, that, or at least every effort would ma be made to calendar it at that time. It has not been calendared. Therefore, we're not sure what's happening. It must go to city planning before it goes to the Board of Estimate. So when I report on where we're at today, I'm really sort of confused. We've exhausted our resources. Uh, trying to find out what's going on, what's holding it up. We've made every effort to bring the building down, even though there was some question in all of our minds of what was really the best building and, and what the real objections were. We brought the building down in height to the lowest it could be. You're our parents and you're our grandparents. And for that alone, we owe you a debt of gratitude. And the fact that you're human beings, you should be able to live a life of dignity and ease and comfort. And it's sad that our society has not done enough and that senior citizens are forced to suffer the degradations of low income and not providing decent services, not enough housing, and poor medical care. I'm running for the city council to represent the entire borough of Brooklyn. And as a city councilman, you have input into certain areas. Not all areas, but areas that we can have an input into. Some of you, I'm sure, have your senior citizen reduced fare cards. In fact, the city of New York has been negligent in the reissuance of those cards, and many people, many senior citizens, are waiting anxiously to find out when they'll get theirs. But getting the card is not the answer, or not enough. A senior citizen no longer should be forced to be considered a second class or a second rate citizen, and that's what you're considered. And what I'd like to do is talk to a few people on film, if we can, um, uh, just before you go home, and ask you about Shore Hill, if any of you want to move in, and what you think of what is going on now. So if a few of you could sort of volunteer to talk to us, I'd appreciate it. It's on at 7.30 every night, Monday to Friday. Why do you think this um, opposition to the Shore Hill project, where is it coming from? Well, I've heard all sorts of ridiculous things about it, that there are certain uh, religious and political groups who are against it. And I'm not quoting anything because, frankly, I don't believe any of it. But it's, uh, some people are so bigoted that their attitude is, oh, well, all such and such a religion are against it, or such and such a, an economic group are against it. And then one person said, and I do not know whether or not this is true, but they said they went to one of the other meetings and the, a young man stood up and said he didn't want to see any more older people sitting on the benches. 
on Shaw Road, and that's a pretty insulting, frightening, humiliating thing to say about people who are over 65, because certainly they're not the kind of people who are carousing and making a big lot of trouble, you know, like some of the groups in certain sections might be doing. There are not very many people over 65 who are given the physical stamina to be much of a trouble. So that's the story as far as I'm concerned. What do you think is going to happen? Well, I only hope that it will go through. Um, I'm afraid the opposition is very strong, but we have great faith that uh, we'll probably overcome it and that we will get uh, uh, Do you think uh, uh, senior citizen groups will be able to put enough political pressure together? Well, we're certainly work. going to try. We, you can see here today that we're going to try. And, of course, uh, many of the senior citizens that just aren't here today, that we have so many clubs today. Our own club has about 300, and there must be 20 of those clubs uh, almost within walking distance. Uh, almost every church today has senior citizen clubs with a membership in the hundreds. Penny Bernstein, you're a producer at Channel 13. How do you think Channel 13 differs from other TV stations? Well, apart from the fact that we don't have commercials, um, the news program, the news magazine that I work on, is very different for us working here. Um, we have one story once a week, every two weeks. Um, we have time to investigate. On, on the commercial networks, they have assignments. We pick our own stories. Um, it ends up where we really do things we care about and um, we have time to find out what that is. And we can drop something if it's not a story. If you have an assignment, you must do it because you have to produce. How do you select the topics you deal with? Yeah. Oh, the subject that I'm working on now, um, I became interested because I, 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 I thought we weren't doing enough in communities that we didn't know anything about. So um, I found out about a project called the Office of Neighborhood Government, which is a pilot project for New York City. There are eight, um, there are eight offices in different neighborhoods in the city. And uh, the purpose is to decentralize control. And I thought it would be interesting to look into one. I picked Bay Ridge because it's a middle class community. It's a community that we normally don't look at because it doesn't have race problems. Um, people there vote conservatively, so they, I mean, they generally don't make waves. They don't get in the news. And um, I thought it would be an interesting project to look into. Do you always work on location, or do you work in studio as well? Um, I like to work in the studio as well, but I think I prefer to work on film because when you work in the studio, you have experts, you have neat little packages, you have people who tell you things that they believe. When you go on location, you work on film, you find people who don't know things, who can't articulate them, and I think it makes a more interesting story. Um, it's better for me because I, I don't like neat packages anyway, and I, I shut off experts. I think we don't listen anymore to experts, so I like to be out on location. Also, I think that on location we see reality, while in studio we don't actually see what the people are talking about. Sometimes it is very different. Yes, because you see, um, if, if we don't go on location, we find politicians who make statements, and it's as if they make the news. And the fact is, the news begins at a very basic level, and when you go out there, no story is really too trivial. If it's a, you know, a few people who are losing their house because they decided to build a, a bridge or something, you get involved, you get publicity for those people. Um, that's really where the news is. Otherwise, you end up with people always taking a political position rather than a human position. And when you go out on location, you find out what it means to people who live in the city. This means you are giving to people who never go into the city or to any meetings an opportunity to see what is going on in their city. Right. We find them um, because they generally don't have the means to find us. They don't have public relations people working for them. And I think really this is what makes us different, is that, I mean, we're very often criticized for being trivial or oh, never doing the unexpected, you know. But um, I think the fact that we care about the little stories is, is what makes the program different. I didn't feel that way when I started to work on the program. Um, I felt it was very boring to go out and do stories about oh, school disputes again and another methadone clinic, more about drugs. I thought this was very boring. But I realized the absolute necessity 
to find out what's going on in communities because we really don't know. I had never been to a community like Bay Ridge. I had passed on the highway around it, but I had no idea of what kind of problems they have. And I think this really is television. I don't think the studio is television anymore. Channel 13 is here for the 51st State Program. Let's go around once to introduce Penny remembers who everyone is from each department. Pat, do you want to start? Yes. Pat Dunn. Yeah, I'm Pat Dunn, Special Assistant to the Administrator in the Park Department. Captain Close, 68 Precinct. John? Chuck Fishman, Office of Neighborhood Government. Helen Joyce, Office of Neighborhood Government. Charlotte Kirk, Office of Neighborhood Government. Thomas DePasco, District Foreman. District Angela Molita, Department of Recreation. In their own neighborhood schools. And we've done 350 already. We found over 35 children with vision defects. And we feel that we can, will be able to test 1,000 children before this term is up. Now, if we had our own mobile unit, it would enable us to bring the new type of screening examinations that we are requiring for school children, as well as the new screening examinations for all Medicaid enrolled children to the neighborhoods. We could bring our doctors and nurses and laboratory technicians set up and do it where the service is needed. It would cost all of about $30,000 or $40,000. But for that, you could purchase good health care <coughs> for perhaps 10,000 children. Well, now, in another area, they're suggesting to have a mobile unit that would do mostly senior citizen testing. Is there this, any way it could be combined? This mobile unit would be available not just uh, for preschool testing and school children testing. We could have it for our health fairs. We can do high blood pressure. Uh, health fairs, we could do a number of other health examinations. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, what happened here this morning? Who was here and uh, what went on? Uh, well, what this was was the regular monthly meeting of the service cabinet. So we had the representatives of the police department, the sanitation department, well, as you saw, health, parks, water. And for the first time today, we were discussing the possibilities of the use of $250,000 in capital funds uh, which we received for the 73-74 budget. What I'm trying to do is to get as much input into the use of this money as possible. So I asked these men today what they thought their departments would want that they cannot get out of the usual departmental budget. Then tonight the task force is meeting and they represent the community, so they'll be giving further suggestions. We've also sent uh, letters to all the community groups asking them what they think should be done with the use of the money. And all of these things will be correlated. For instance, the task force will evaluate the ones we heard today. The next month, the cabinet will evaluate the task force. And then we hope to have some uh, public meetings where they, the public can hear all of these suggestions. The good points about them, the points, as you heard, some of them think it's too hard to maintain or too difficult to maintain some of these items. And finally, we'll submit to the uh, Borough Improvement Board the suggestions that we want implemented. Yes. Sorry, boys. Sure. What do you Which side? Which side? Show with your hands. Which side? Which side? Which side? Which side? Show us with your other hand. Yeah, we thought again the principle of trying to bring city services where the people are rather than making people go to the city service. We asked the local board of education if they would give us permission to come into the local schools, which would be easy for the parents, easy for us to find a place in the school and wouldn't disrupt anything as far as the board did. So they approved it. We schedule meetings with all the parents two weeks in advance to show them what it is, to let them have an e-card to bring home and test their children, and then they come back two weeks later and the health officer and her nurses and staff test the children. If they do have indications that this disease, uh, problem or any other eye problem might be there, then they're either referred to their own doctor for further test or the health center will give them a second testing of it. Is this done in any other district? 
that you know of? No, not that I know of. I think it may go into other districts, but I think we were the first in the city who did come up with this program. How did the Office of Neighborhood Government function in, in getting this? Did you cut corners? No, again, it wasn't cutting corners. It was just coordinating, knowing that the test was available, and then getting another city agency, the Board of Education, to cooperate and have the health do the test and the Board of Education provide the facility. Again, a, a new service to the community, but no added expense, no added personnel. And I think the, the children are well served by it. Thank you. You're not afraid that people will appear wide open while they're really only acting for the camera. You don't think they try to hide things in front of the camera. I think that Americans or New Yorkers are so sophisticated now. Everyone is aware of the process. Um, when we went to the school, everyone wanted to get on. I, I don't think you can... Um, it's an exercise in purity to think that if the camera wasn't there, the, uh, the situation would be different. I don't think we can think about it. I, th I think it's more important that we are there. However we change it, I, I don't think it's very significant. Um, I think also we have to be sensible enough to become aware if someone is just acting for the camera. I, I seldom think about it. I think in the old days, when Cinema Verite was newer, we used to worry about whether this was truthful or not. But I don't think about it. I don't think I do voyeuristic stories. I don't think I take the camera in to show something that I can't relate to. So I think it is a service. I think that it, we must do community programming. And therefore, I don't think that what I'm doing can be voyeuristic. So then I stop worrying. Do you get any feedback? Um, it depends on what we're doing. Uh, last Christmas, when, um, when uh, President Nixon uh, was saturation bombing North Vietnam, we went on and said, let us know what you think, and, and, and we'll read the letters on the air. And from that one question, we received 800 letters. I think this is terribly rare. I don't think a news show in New York or anywhere else gets 800 letters without anything very controversial happening. We just ask them a question. And um, I think people were very anxious to respond just because of the emotionalism of the issue. But when they responded because of the issue, they also said, we worry every day that you'll go off the air. And uh, that, uh, I think our audience is a very committed audience because of the kind of work we do. Yes, but things like Vietnam or Watergate are national issues. With something like Bay Ridge, do you expect any feedback from the population? I think so. I think everyone has to respond. For instance, what we're doing today, they say there was political interference in the project. Well, the next step for me is to contact those politicians. So if nothing else, the people there who don't get response from the politicians will know that if they didn't respond to me, at least I can say no comment. And I, th I think everyone watches. Politicians don't like not to be on top of an issue because they, uh, you know, they don't get reelected that way. So obviously publicity has a tremendous effect on both sides. Do you think that a TV station like WNET in New York is a necessary tool for a big city now? By tool, I mean, do you think it helps citizens to relate to one another? Well, it's very difficult for us to operate because one of the things that we would like to do is go to communities like Bay Ridge with tape cameras even, with open-ended time. Um, if our show began at 9, we would go on until 11. I think that kind of thing is necessary. We don't have the money yet. But I think that is, is the direction that a few of us would like to go in is to really have more open programs, you know, less structure. Um, and I, th I think the community wants that too. In one way, I think that such TV is a democratic tool, but it can also represent the start of an information overload. If people receive too much information, if they're deluged with information, they begin to turn off after a while. You're not afraid of this? Um, I don't know. I go home some nights and I turn on television and I want to watch the moving pictures go past my eyes. But that doesn't mean that I don't care about things that go on that affect my life. So the fact that I don't watch everything, because there is a lot of talk, and I watch the banality sometimes, um, I think you have to keep doing it because I think people 
I think they don't know enough. I don't think we do a good enough job of explaining the very complex issues, the things that change so quickly in our society. And I, I, you know, I think television has a lot more responsibility than any of us know, because people do get their news from us. And I, I don't think we do a very good job of it. And part of that is that we have to respond so quickly because we don't have footnotes, we can't, you know, we don't ever take the time. And that's why I said we should have open-ended programs sometimes. What is I, I don't think there's too much talk. I think there's too much banality. Thank you.